Hey, it's Jim, and this is level one of the CFA program, the topic on alternative investments and the learning module on an introduction to digital assets. Uh, the very first sentence of this learning module tells us that this is a relatively new investments class, but it fits right in line with our conversations that we've had in every one of the other alternative investments learning module. There's a conversation on diversification. There's a conversation on uh, anticipating higher returns, but with an extra layer of risk. And that's pretty much what this learning module tells us about is what are those, what are those extra layers of risk and how do they provide us with extra compensation? Of course, examples of digital assets include cryptocurrencies and digital collectibles and fan tokens. Um, I mean, what do you suspect the correlation coefficient is between, let's say, a share of Procter & Gamble stock and uh, an FC Barcelona fan token? I mean, I'm guessing it's zero, but maybe it's not. In fact, at the very end of this learning module, there's a small table in which uh, the Institute tells us that the correlation coefficient between Bitcoin and some index, I think it's the S&P 500 index, is, is 0.21. I would, have, I would have thought it was uh, lower. But nevertheless, nevertheless, it's, it's near, near zero. Let's take a look at the learning outcome statements. Notice we're going to do lots of describing and explaining. Look at the bottom one there. Um, I would have thought that this would have been the most important of the four LOSs. But the Institute only spends just uh, maybe two pages on risk return and diversification. And I probably summarized a little bit of it in that, in that previous slide. But the focus seems to be this uh, distributed ledger technology, which is a theme throughout. And we'll talk about the features and we'll talk about forms and vehicles. So let's start with this concept of a distributed ledger technology, which is really nothing more than a shared database across networks. So what I want you to do is I want you to think about this assignment. Suppose I said to you guys, and let's suppose there are 20 of you out there in, uh, in my class. And I say, what I want you to do is I want you to go and I want you to put together the balance sheet for Nike. So what do we need to do? We need to do current assets and current liabilities, right? We need to do all that stuff. So let's start with cash and cash equivalents. So I'm not going to send all 20 of you to determine what those cash and cash equivalents accounts are, but maybe I'd send 11 of you. I picked 11 for a certain reason here, right? So 11 of you go and we've got this big spreadsheet and the first one figures out the number and enters 100 into the cell. And then the rest, the other 10 of you, you know, you're doing all of your work and you say, oh, yeah, I, I got 10, I got 10, I got 10. So you're confirming, you're validating that that's 10. And so that 10 then appears on the spreadsheet so that all 20 people, plus me and maybe anybody else that I want to, they can look at this and they say, oh, Nike has 100 in, in uh accounts, uh, I'm sorry, cash and cash equivalents. And then you do the same thing with inventory, the same thing and the same thing. And so each one of you is building and you come up, whoever's the first one puts the number in and then the rest of the rest of the students, then they say, oh yeah, that's the correct answer. And so you build this balance sheet, this huge balance sheet. So that's really what, you know, what did I just say? A shared database across a network. You know, why, why do we do this? Well, we want some accuracy, so we have 11 people doing it, right? We want transparency, we put it out there, and I guess I'm just assuming that we can trust those one and those other 10 people. We'll talk about that trust here in just a little bit. Uh, security, faster asset ownership transfer. I mean, there's all different sorts of crazy, really, really cool things about this DLT technology that, uh, that are its advantages. So I think this is probably a good exam question over in the green. Now, what do we have to worry about? We have to worry about some bad actor out there who's saying something like, hey, you know what? I'm going to go in and I'm going to change that 100 in cash and cash equivalents to, to a four. You know, so imagine if that four gets changed and everybody on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange says, wait a minute, I thought the current ratio was this, but it's really this number here. Let's go ahead and sell, sell, sell. All right, so uh, privacy breaches, security breaches, data protection, and all those, uh, all those kinds of, 
uh, uh, disadvantages. So remember the blue and the green over there. I think that's a, uh, I think that's a pretty good uh, potential exam question. Let me give you another quick example. Years ago, I mean like 20 years ago, I had a buddy who uh, was a futures contract trader on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And one of my buddies from graduate school and I went and visited him. And so we were, you know, we were right there standing by the trading pit. And, you know, this is back in the old days when, you know, they had these little cards. And so there were a lot of hand signals. And so they write down, you know, whether it was a short or the long position. And then to, to process that data and that information, they would take the little card and they would fling it down into the pit. You know how these pits are, you know, they build up like steps and, and there's a dude down there. He has a hat on, he has a big net and he's catching all of these things. Of course, some of the people were frisbeeing him, trying to knock his head off. Uh, so anyway, this dude down at the bottom, his job was to collect the data and confirm like, oh yeah, here's a short position and over here is a long position. So let's enter that into the computer. And so there's our process of, of validation. I mean, think about the human error with that. Compare that futures example uh, to, to my Excel spreadsheet and to this uh, distributed ledger technology. I mean, nowadays, I mean, this is a great example of an application of DLT to futures contract trading. Instead of, instead of the guy down there trying to figure out and duck all of the shots that are coming and trying to record all this stuff, you know, there's just this network. What did I say? A shared database. And so there's this confirmation. It's called, going to be called consensus here in just a little bit to try to improve all these things over here. Heightened accuracy, transparency, records, you know, ownership transfers, et cetera, et cetera. All right, let's talk about the uh, key components of a DLT network. So look in the middle under orange. So there's the digital letter. So instead of this guy, this guy standing there and keeping track of all these physical, physical proof that there was a transaction, there's a digital letter out there. And it's okay to think of it as a gigantic Excel spreadsheet. So what do we do? We start entering these trades in. So what do we do? We, one person took the short position, one took the long position in a futures contract. So this gets entered into the digital ledger. And then we need some kind of a consensus mechanism to validate that, uh, that transaction. Now, you, you would think that you could just go and interview all the people on the floor of the uh, in the pit of the exchange, but that's a total waste of time. So we need kind of a better way. We need a consensus mechanism. And that's where it gets super, super interesting. That's where we bring in this process and this idea of a blockchain and miners. But before we get into that, go ahead and take a look at the, the bottom there. What are we doing? We're validating transactions. We're securing a consensus, which means then that the public record, anybody who can see this Excel spreadsheet or whatever the form is, they know that those records are accurate and they're going to stay accurate because they're unalterable. You know, once the consensus is reached, there's a mechanism that says, well, nobody can change it. Think of it as like locking one of the cells in your Excel spreadsheet. You know, it's not like if you're at a, a major soccer game, lots of you call it football out there, and you see uh, Lionel Messi score a goal, right? So there's a reporter there who's going to write an article, Lionel Messi scored a goal. He's not going to go and interview all 70,000 people. Now, did you see that? Are you sure that was a goal? Was that a goal? Look at the TV replay. You know, you just figured out, oh, we watched it. And there's a TV record of it. There's 70,000 people who can confirm it. So this is just, you know, kind of the idea of transparency. Now, of course, we need some kind of a secret handshake. You guys have ever watched that uh, Seinfeld episode where, uh, where Kramer gets uh, beaten up by the Van Buren boys. That's a super funny episode. But you know, we, we have to crypto these kinds of things. We need to make them secure. So high level of network security and integrity. But what that means is that introduces this concept of a smart contract. Let me read that diamond point to you and then I'm gonna give you an example. Self-executing, that's super important. A program based on predefined, predetermined terms and conditions that are agreed upon by all the people involved. So here's my here's one of my silly examples. So imagine that I'm out there shopping and I'm with my entire family 
and we come across a store and I go to this rack and I pick up a Josh Allen number 17 Buffalo Bills jersey. And I look at it and I, you know, and I look at it and I put it back. And my family observed all this and they said, you know what, it looks like dad is a fan of Josh Allen. Maybe he would like that shirt, that jersey for Father's Day. So what could my family do? They could just go out and buy it and wait and give it to me on Father's Day, right? But what they could do is they could execute a smart contract. They could say something like, all right, so here we are. We're in this, this, uh, this shared database. Here's a supply of Josh Allen jerseys. And maybe you could see some demand over here. Maybe, maybe not. But, uh, you know, the idea is that my family could enter a smart contract. They could say, okay, three days before Father's Day, we want to buy our father a $200 Josh Allen jersey. We want it in blue. We want his name printed on the back, just like it is in the regular old football games. And we want to pay, what did I say, $200? We don't want to pay any more than $200. We'll pay less than $200 if we can. And maybe there's some other stipulations. We want it delivered by FedEx. Uh, we want some other kind of condition. So we can put all those predefined terms. So my family could do this. You know, suppose it's January or February. When's, uh, when's Father's Day? You know, sometime in, uh, sometime in June. So my family, they could say, wait a minute, wait a minute. And one of my children might, would say, wait a minute, suppose dad isn't alive for Father's Day this year. So they have to put that in. You know, assuming that dad is still alive for Father's Day, there's a predefined term. And then one of my other children might say, well, what if Josh Allen does something that dad doesn't like? <laughs> He's not going to want to wear that in between now and then. So if Josh Allen uh, stays out of the criminal process or whatever, whatever it is, or if Josh Allen does something good, you know, I mean, all these predefined terms. So if we meet all these terms, what did I say? Three days before Father's Day, boom, the contract is executed. The money comes out of my family's account. It goes into a box and it gets shipped to our house. And then we have Father's Day and everyone's happy. Now, this is probably super important for the transfer of ownership that we talked about in that previous slide for um, specifically derivative securities. You know, what do we call these things? An option, right? But not the obligation to trade. A futures contract is the obligation of, to trade. But, and so whenever you, you, know, you have these trades, you're probably going to put up some kind of a margin, maybe some other kind of collateral. So these are kind of conditions that you could put in there in these predefined terms. So this idea of a smart contract depends on this uh, DL technology. Now let's go back to my uh, futures trading pit. So here's an example of this DLT. So blockchain is a type of a digital letter, ledger. So look at the nodes. So if, if you think about the trading pit, each of those nodes could be each of the traders. And that makes sense there with those, all those little uh, lines in between. But of course, you don't have to be on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. You could have one node in Chicago. You could have Santa Claus could be another node. You could have somebody at the South Pole. You could have somebody here and somebody over there. Right. But they all have access to this network and then each one has access to the ledger. You know, so there are the blue rectangles out there. And so what happens? Well, the Josh Allen shirt, the uh, euro dollar futures contract short position, the uh, call option buy or the put option right any of those trades they could be entered into this ledger and there are a set of rules so this transaction goes into this block and there's a block with all of the determined factors of the trade of the trade of the transaction and then what happens is that these things then get verified or validated. It's called a consensus. I'll talk about that here in just a second of how we do the consensus. But just think of it as being in the uh, in the soccer audience. You knew that Messi scored the goal. Everybody around you know that Messi scored the goal. So how do we verify this when we're on the floor of a futures exchange? How do we verify, verify it for the Josh Allen t-shirt or the Josh Allen shirt? So what happens then is that there's 
my let's do my Josh Allen. So there's my trade that gets executed. That gets it gets verified. So that's one block. But then maybe there's somebody else over there who's buying that same jersey. So that goes into another block. And then those blocks they're all linked. So it's called a block chain. And then each block, as it is verified, then it becomes, well, let me just go back here. It becomes accurate, it becomes transparent, it becomes secure, and what it does, it leads to the transfer of ownership, depending on you know those preset of rules. So you go back to that kind of concept of the, uh, of the smart, smart contracts. So here are, here are the steps. I'm not sure this is a great exam question, but I can see the Institute saying, hey, uh, which of the following steps is not part of the protocol? So the transaction occurs. So let's just do my, uh, let's just do my long and short of the Euro dollar futures contract, right? So there's a buyer and a seller. So there's that block then. It is created or it is formed, you know, somewhere around that node. And then what happens is that computers, and you know, this is not like Arnold Schwarzenegger and the Terminator. These, these are computers that could be over there. They could be way over there. What they do is they validate that transaction. And then that transaction can be combined with other, other transactions that generate new blocks. So there you have the blockchain. And then these uh, have to be uh, in a clandestine manner. So cryptography is important so that you can't go back and change what happened in the previous block. And then that's when the transaction is deemed complete. And then the ledger is updated, much like we did when we went to Nike and we found out what their cash and cash equivalents are. Now, um, there's this concept of a hash. And so once you, once you verify the transaction, it's called like solving the problem. It's called solving the hash. So what we want is we want lots and lots of hashes to be able to make certain that the network is secure. So the strength of the network depends on you know, what's inside the block, but then the links between each of the two blocks, these secure links, and then that thing is is a hash, you know. So just think of it as a hash going through, um, going through all of these different blocks to verify that they in fact uh, occurred. Now there are two, uh, essentially two ways to consent these things. So the proof of work is a consensus mechanism. Proof of stake is another consensus of mechanism. And this is a great exam question. What's the difference between the two? Let me, let me tell you the answer to the question. Let's just skip ahead to uh, proof of stake here. Look, where is it in there? Look at the top right, pledge collateral, uh, I'm sorry, pledge capital. So some collateral as a stake, so proof of stake. So this computer then has to put up some of his or her own capital. I'll tell you all about that here in just a second. All right, so what's what's happening here about this proof of work? So let's go back to my futures contract transaction. So we have a short position and a long position. So we put it in the ledger. Somebody has to come and verify that. And in order to verify that, they need to solve a complex mathematical problem. Now, I'm not nearly smart enough to tell you about that complex mathematical problem, but let me give you a super simple one that both you and I can uh, can solve. Let's suppose that you're this computer over there, and this is a high-powered computer. This is not just what I have here uh, at, at my desk. Um, and so this is a miner. We call the computer, we call it a miner. And what's happening out there is that it's solving this complex problem. So suppose I gave you this math problem. What is 2 plus x equals 4? All right. There's a there's a math problem, right? I don't know what that is. Is that even algebra? Uh, you learned that in kindergarten with the two apples and the four apples, and it has to be the two. All right. So the answer is two. All right. So you solve this complex mathematical problem, and you then have the right to go in and solve this, not solve this, and verify that that uh, that that trade took place. So the the two plus X equals four has everything to do with the transaction. What that means then is that, think about these miners out there, these computers, they're using up lots and lots of energy, uh, lots and lots of capital, so there has to be compensation. So when you're a miner out there and you solve this mathematical problem and you verify 
that the trade actually took place, well, you get paid for it. You get a compensation. It's usually in the form of some kind of a cryptocurrency. I mean, it's mostly it's mostly a Bitcoin, of course. And so what do you do? You, you, you invest in this computer and the computer solves two plus X equals four. And then you get some Bitcoins and then you, you know, you pay for your computer and then you go out and you buy yourself uh, a new television or whatever that is. So look at the bottom there. They earn cryptocurrency rewards, but miners need a substantial amount uh, of energy. Now, there's a really small section in this learning module about this 51% attack. So imagine the network consists of a uh, uh, 100, 100 nodes out there. Well, it's possible that one person or a group of people can control 51 out of those 100. And this is known as a 51% attack. So if they can control the network, then they can go in and they can reuse a Bitcoin. You know, so a Bitcoin already been used. They go in and they change some code and they can steal. It's just like it's thievery. That's exactly what it is. Look at the bottom. It's difficult to execute such an attack because there's so much compensation that there's hardly ever a small network out there. It's usually inundated. Uh, with uh, with these miners. Um, so I, I can't imagine the Institute would ask you a question on this because it's just such a small part of this learning module. But if, if it does, just, just remember 51%, taking control and then spending Bitcoins that have already been spent. How about that? All right, let's move on to the proof of stake. So this is exactly like uh, what we just did with the POW, but this one here is we have some kind of capital that we're going to pledge. And so we still, it's, it's pretty much the same thing, but we're gonna pledge a stake in there. So when the computer comes in, we'll say something like, all right, here's a hundred Bitcoins. We're gonna stake that and we're gonna put this up and you guys can have it if we don't solve the problem or if we're wrong or if we do something that's illegal or or, or. Um, so there have been several attempts. You could do a quick search on this. What were some examples of 51% attacks, but they're not, uh, they're not uh, too substantial. Now we can go through uh, two types of networks, permissionless and permissioned. You probably don't even need me to read this stuff to you. They're exactly what the names suggest. So there's a couple of uh, bullet points on permissionless. There is a couple of bullet points on permission, but what I want you to do is I want you to get out your phone and take a picture of this. Uh, if there are any exam questions, this is gonna give you the answer. Take a picture of this. There you got down the left-hand column, speed and cost, decentralization, access and governance. And so you have this, uh, you have this right there. So that should be perfectly fine. Let's move on to this concept of digital assets and the Institute uh, is very clear on breaking these down into two types, tokens and cryptocurrencies. So we'll spend the next few minutes talking about those two. But one of the first sentences in this section of the learning module references this DLT in its ability to improve our life as uh, wealth advisors and financial analysts in terms of efficiency, in terms of streamlining. You read that word uh, multiple times inside of the learning module. Uh, look down at the bottom there, enable almost instantaneous transactions. Ah, digital assets. All right, so here we go, two parts, cryptocurrencies and tokens. There are some good examples. Let's go through, uh, let's go through a couple of these. Skip down to that third diamond point there. Cryptocurrencies, of course, serve as a digital medium of exchange, which means that you don't really need a central bank or any kind of a monetary authority to issue a $1 bill and tell you what you can or cannot do with, uh, with that $1 bill. So look at the next um, diamond point down there decentralized. I mean, that's that's important here. There is no central bank, although we'll see here in just a few minutes that there are some central banks out there that are exploring the concept of a uh, of a governmental cryptocurrency. Now, the learning module does work through some discussions on voting tools and vote modifications 
and preservation of value. Uh, I'm not sure that those sound like really, really good exam questions, but nevertheless, here they are on the slide, so you can, you can see those. All right, here are this concept of a central bank digital currency. Yeah, they're not backed or regulated by the government, but there are a handful of central banks out there that are exploring this idea that you can find some advantages for their unique cryptocurrencies. Uh, I'm not quite sure what that means. If the U.S. central bank issues a U.S. cryptocurrency, I'll probably just start crying. All right, what is this, uh, what is this, how does this relate to um, the, the streamlined process of tokenization? So with this, this idea of a token, you know, a token is just, you know, kind of like a, a little thing. Here's a token of our appreciation. But a token in the digital world means something a little bit differently than, than just, oh, here's, let me hand, shake your hand. There's a token of my appreciation. So we have some specific tokens that are out there. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to form a process through this DLT so that we can transfer ownerships of these digital assets. So go back to my Nike spreadsheet example where we were looking at, what were we looking at? Cash and cash equivalents. Well, now let's go ahead and suppose that we have some type of a digital asset and we want to sell it. Well, how do we do this? Well, we go ahead and do this. So all the stuff that we did, remember in that previous slide, we had step one and two and three and four, all those kinds of, uh, all those kinds of steps. Look down at the bottom diamond point, eliminates extensive paperwork and legal formalities so that we can establish a digital ownership record. So let's start with this concept of a non-fungible token. Of course, those of you who have been paying attention to any of my uh, recordings over the years know that I'm a gigantic James Bond fan in this last movie, which those of you who paid attention know that I was not a fan of it. In fact, it was clearly the worst James Bond movie ever. But this, uh, this, this most recent movie, the last one with Daniel Craig, they introduced the James Bond token. And I was tempted to do some research, but I didn't. I don't want to know how much it costs because uh, if when it came out, I would have shorted it after I saw the movie and I'm certain that I would have made tons and tons of money. So whatever that means, a non-fungible token means that it's a token that can relate to James Bond, NBA players, football players, a piece of artwork, uh, you know, almost anything out there. And so essentially what you're doing is you're stamping it with that authenticity, a certificate of authenticity, which goes back to the miners and those uh, and those high powered computers. And, and by the way, these are not just high powered computers that are sitting in somebody's basement. You know, these are actual companies that buy all these computers. And then we'll see this in a minute. You can buy stock or buy the bonds in these companies that are mining uh, all of this throughout the uh, throughout the DLT. How about security and utility tokens? So think about this, you know, when you go to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and you say, hey, I want to buy a share of Nike. So you turn over your money, you get a share of stock. Somebody has to record it because if Nike pays a dividend, then you have to get the dividend, right? And so it's a whole process. Well, suppose that we can digitize that ownership. So these uh, security and utility tokens are ownership rights tied to publicly traded securities. And so the ownership, the trading, and all those details, they can be put in the blockchain so that, you know, there's really no, uh, there's really no concern about uh, ownership or transparency. Think about, uh, think about that great movie. My wife loves, uh, uh, my, my wife loves to watch the Die Hard movie uh, around Christmas time. Actually, she'll, she's a big Bruce Willis fan. She'll watch it at any time. So what were they doing? They were stealing $600 million with the worth of German bearer bonds, right? So if, if we could tokenize those German bearer bonds, then who cares if they're, if they're stolen or not, right? They're digitized. And so that ownership is transparent. It's accurate and all, all those kinds of good things. Where else can you go to get Bruce Willis and, uh, and finance? How about some examples here? An initial, initial coin offering, not an IPO, but an ICO. 
And so <clears throat> uh, this works pretty much like it does in, uh, in regular old IPO markets. I mean, uh, but since it's digitized, it's probably way lower of a cost to issue. And you probably do it in a shorter time period. Yeah, look at that second diamond point, the blue one. Lower issuance costs, shorter capital raising time frames. Those are probably two pretty good exam questions. Uh, it, these governance tokers, uh, tokens, the decentralized finance, this is all part of the D5 platform. And so we can have these governance tokens that have authority to do something, whatever that something might be. <clears throat> A couple of quick slides here that may show up as good exam questions. Um, digital assets gain considerable importance. That makes perfect sense. Alternative asset, that's why we're concluding it in this, uh, in this learning module. There's, there's an example there. Um, what are those financial service providers? What do they look like out there? And so there are digital exchanges. We'll go ahead and talk about this in a slide or two. Uh, but I'm guessing when you read about a digital exchange, you think about that dude, what was his name, uh, SBF? Uh, who was indicted on uh, whatever it is that he did with uh, FTX. You know, there are a range of services from investment houses to exchanges that you can, uh, that you can um, add this particular alternative investment into your portfolio. Now, there are some good differences here between digital and traditional finance assets, but I'm going to go ahead and skip ahead and get ready to take a picture when, when we get to this slide. Get your phone out. You know, so differences in inherent value. This is probably important. You know, a share stock has intrinsic value, but digital assets probably have, uh, have some kind of different intrinsic value. There's, there's no cash flow. There's no, there's no dividend. There's no uh, share repurchase. There's no, none of that, right? Uh, validating transactions. Here's that example of my uh, futures contract where the traders were throwing their cards down to the poor dude uh, with wearing a hat, you know, so logged in private ledgers, right? So we know this decentralized digital letter. That's the blockchain that we talked about. Differences in use as a medium exchange and legal and regulatory. So get out your, get out your camera, take a picture of this slide. And I can't imagine that the Institute would ask you a question where this doesn't give you the answer. So let's continue our conversation and find out how can we invest in these things. So there are tons and tons of these cryptocurrencies that are out there. Of course, it all started with Bitcoin, you know, somewhere around, uh, I don't know, it's been 15 years or so by now. Uh, notice that those two still dominate the market as of uh, 2022. Look at this, $1 trillion uh, is the equivalent. You know, there are some interesting statistics here and characteristics of, of uh, Bitcoin and altcoin and stable coins. Not quite sure what the Institute would be thinking in terms of what kind of good exam questions? Bitcoin remains influential. That sounds like uh, not a very good question. But down here, look under the altcoins there. You know, and there are a couple different ones there. Uh, Ethereum, Litecoin. This is the one where the smart contracts were kind of created and introduced. So that might be that might be the better question um, about this. Stable coins. You probably would know this without me even explaining explaining it to you. All we're going to do is we're going to offer a coin that's stable. And that doesn't mean that it goes like this, right? Its value doesn't go like this, but we're going to tie it to something. Maybe we're going to tie it to the value of gold, uh, maybe the U.S. dollar. Probably don't want to tie it to the U.S. dollar in 2021 and 2022 with tons and tons of inflation out there. Maybe this is a good exam question. The uh, limitations there, no regulatory backing, uh, ability to exchange for any kind of a currency. You know, what are these benefits here? Easy settlement processes. Um, you know, you have access to these asset backed tokens. And there are meme coins that were initiated by a joke. I know one of my children said to me, this is probably a year ago, that uh, some crazy thing sold for hundreds of thousands of dollars. And uh, he was just thinking, gosh, why didn't I, I didn't do that. So we can do this directly by going directly into uh, Bitcoin 
or directly into the blockchain. So you need a cryptocurrency wallet. The problem with that is that you have a, you have a key to the wallet and if you ever lose that key, then all your money just goes away. That, that's the big problem. Uh, or you can do this indirectly through exchange traded products, which we talked about those exchanges in uh, SBF here just a minute ago. And hedge funds, of course, hedge funds, you know, they're on the front edge of this kind of investing because they have lots and lots of access to capital. And remember that, you know, the hedge fund manager doesn't have to return your capital next week. <clears throat> Here's another uh, potentially good exam question, the difference between centralized and decentralized exchanges. You know, so we have this slide here and this slide here. Uh, I'm not sure you need to take a picture of this, but you know, these are exactly what you would think. These are common sense differences between a central marketplace and then, you know, marketplace that goes uh, all over the place. Uh, anything interesting here that I should mention? Um, maybe not. Uh, varying regulations on the centralized exchange, but there's probably very little ex uh, regulation over on decentralization. So look down at the bottom. Potential for creating illegal activities, fraud, manipulation. What did I say earlier? You know, that 51% you can get in and you can reuse those, uh, those cryptocurrencies or Bitcoins. I like these down at the bottom. I, I would ask this if I were the CFA Institute with questions, go ahead. Fraud risk, you know, there's some examples there. Um, access risk, there's that digital wallet that I was telling you about. And then concentration risk, so this is, uh, uh, you know, this is directly related to the problems of diversification when you think you're diversified, but yet you're concentrated. Uh, these cryptocurrency coin trusts, you know, these are probably traded with financial institutions over the counter. And they probably look an awful lot like a mutual fund, probably a closed end mutual fund. And remember, they're not they're not a lot of closed end mutual funds anymore like they were back back in the old days. But what it allows you to do is <clears throat> invest in a portfolio of these different cryptocurrencies and digital assets that we talked about. Now, a cryptocurrency coin trust would be just the Bitcoin and all those other ones, but you could have you could have a trust that has the non fungible tokens in there or utility tokens. I mean, you could create uh, you could create anything down uh, anything that you wanted to look down at the bottom. There's the big problem there. Substantial fees and expenses. Of course, these financial institutions is not like a forward contract where you go to JP Morgan and say, hey, I want a forward contract. And they say, pay me $10 for that thing. They're going to say, wait a minute, you know, this is a new area. We're not going to sure what's going on. We're going to charge you a bunch. Now, here's where it gets super cool. Um, you know, going back here, we can invest in these in the spot market, but here we can say something like, hey, you know what? You know what? Let's go back to my earlier example. If I'd have known this when that James Bond movie came out, I would have said, hey, take me to the futures contract and the futures market and I'm going to short that contract. I'm sure I would have won. Uh, I would have generated a huge profit. Now, this is just cryptocurrency, right? So a couple of important things here. You know, all we're doing is taking the long and short position, betting on whether that particular cryptocurrency or I mean, it could be a portfolio of cryptocurrencies, whether that's going to rise or or fall in value over, you know, relatively short term, you know, three months or six months. Uh, notice that second bullet point there settled in cash. Now, you've heard me say this before that, you know, it's like 98, 98, 99 percent of all futures contracts are settled in cash. But you know, if, if you enter a cattle futures contract and, and you want to buy the cattle, you can actually have them delivered to your front yard. I mean, it's your choice, but you don't have that choice in a cryptocurrency futures contract. So they're all they're all settled in cash. Of course, there are margins, there's leverage, there's all sorts of um, liquidity issues and price volatility. Remember, on the regular old cattle futures market, you know, there's not probably a problem or an issue with liquidity because A, you know, there are a bunch of cows out there and B, there are a bunch of farmers out there and C, there are a bunch of people that want the milk and the steak and the hamburgers. So, you know, there's a huge demand and supply for these things, which adds to the liquidity of that cattle futures market. But here you don't, you probably don't have, uh, you don't have that. 
Well, you can you can invest in uh, an ETF just like we do regular kinds of ETFs. You can also invest. This is what I was saying earlier, right? Cryptocurrency mining companies. You can have payment providers. You can invest or transact in those corporations. I mean, you can do all sorts of fun things out there. Now, I did mention this a little bit earlier that hedge funds, of course, they were, uh, you know, they were the first groups of people to take long and short positions. We did, we did that in a previous uh, learning module. So you're not surprised to learn that hedge funds were probably the first kind of people to uh, the first kind of financial institutions to invest in cryptocurrencies and and digital assets. Notice what we have in bold boost their return. Uh, yeah, this is all fun stuff. Now, what we can do is we can digitize a physical asset like uh, like a bar of gold. How about if I go back to a great James Bond movie? I can't I can't say all bad things about James Bond. Let's go back to Goldfinger. Uh, when the dude drops that big bar of gold in front of James Bond. Yeah. Oh, that was so cool. I get shivers every time I uh, every time I watch that. So we could digitize that particular bar of gold, or we could digitize just you know a regular piece of gold. Like uh, I guess I could digitize my ring. Have I ever held this up to you guys? You know I've been married for a hundred years, my wife and I. Uh, these this was this was two hundred dollars, and it was on sale for a hundred dollars. So my wife and I we have our two wedding bands for. Uh, for $200. So I could digitize this, right? And then I could sell it. I don't know who would want to buy it, but uh, but I could. Maybe one of my students would out there would, would want to buy it. I'm sure they wouldn't pay $100 for it. All right, so what uh, what are some advantages here? So we're talking about things that we've done before, you know, diversification, transparency, record keeping, all that kind of good stuff. But instead of having to go out and, and uh, now in that 1963, um, I'm sorry, 1964 Goldfinger movie, um, they said that that gold bar was worth 5,000 pounds, right? So that was back then, you know, a thousand years ago. Well, who knows what that's worth today? I guess I could have figured that out. But, you know, that thing, you would have to spend whatever that is. But you could buy a fraction of that. You could buy this uh, asset back token at a fraction of that price. You know, it's almost, it's almost like, it's almost like buying an option. Almost, but not, not quite. Now, how do we issue these asset back tokens? Well, we can do this almost any way we want. You know, look at the uh, computers that are linked over there. Um, we're probably going to do this through some kind of a non-central or a decentralized platform. We're probably going to use some kind of an application and we're probably going to use a smart contract. So that's probably a good answer to an exam question. Smart contracts peer to peer for the issuance of these asset backed tokens. Now, here's this concept of decentralized finance, uh, DeFi, in which we're going to go ahead and say something like, you know what, we don't need any of those people out there. What we need is these people over here and these people over here doing whatever they want. Now, of course, the process of blockchain is going to verify the whatever they want. And so we don't rely on somebody to make decisions for us. So decentralized, so open source financial applications medium of exchange, storing value, tokenization, recording asset ownership. Here's this concept of the smart contract again. So look at the bullet point there, you know, lending, trading, investment, settlement, pay payment, authentication, instant transfers. You know, these are all really, really cool things. Now, look, I I'm not saying here and I'm editorializing. I'm not saying that, hey, decentralized finance, this is the wave of the future. This is where we're going to be in five years. But I'm not going to stand here. Actually, I'm sitting. I'm not going to sit here and say that this is not the future. You know, I'm 62 years old. Who knows how much longer I'm going to live? I don't know if I'll be around when we have all of the world's financial institutions operating on smart contracts. But this is important for exam questions. Look at those bottom two things here, right? Two uh, arrow points time efficiency and risk management or risk mitigation in lots and lots of different ways. So here we go. Early stages requires further development. Who knows what the future is, but we've laid the groundwork so that, you know, maybe we're going to build up or maybe it's just going to crumble. Who knows? All right, what about uh, what about these risk and returns of digital assets? So what did I say in the introduction? We, we're going to expect higher compensation, right? 
we're not going to get a dividend, but we're going to expect to buy low and sell high, right? Capital gain. Uh, but we're going to get extra layers of risk. So we talked in the last, you know, 30 minutes or so about all of these extra kinds of risk. And so we need to rely on um, our knowledge of traditional finance and investment in stocks and bonds, and then just apply it to these digital assets. Now, one of the interesting things, look down at the bottom bullet point there, you know, Bitcoin, a cap supply, you know, whatever that means, that's kind of like, it's kind of like you guys, basketball fans, you know, the NBA has a salary cap. And this is what I always tell my students and my family, and I probably have mentioned this at some other time. If I didn't in level one, you'll hear it in level two or level three. That, you know, someone like LeBron James is absolutely underpaid, regardless of what his salary, because the NBA has a salary cap. And so the same thing kind of applies here um, with Bitcoin and all these other digital assets. So what about, what about volatility? Um, this is what we know. And there's a table or two at the end of this learning module that um, standard deviation of cryptocurrency is still way higher. You know, if you look at if you look at the, uh, the standard deviation of the S&P 500 index, it's always in the high teens. You know, sometimes it's 16 percent, sometimes it's 19 percent. But Bitcoin is, you know, maybe double that, even though it used to be super uh, way higher than double. But it's fallen, but it's still uh it still has a huge standard deviation compared to traditional assets. So then the you know the question is, all right, what's that correlation coefficient? Am I going to get diversification benefits? In other words, if we have a stock market crash, uh, is everyone going to sell their stocks and then move it into Bitcoin? Oh my gosh, well, that's what we want, right? If we're investing in these digital assets. Yeah, lacking clear legal safeguards. So that should give you a pause as good financial analysts. Um, however, however, you know, there are governments out there that are investigating this. And so sooner or later, we're going to come along with uh, with some type, some type of a law. Uh, yeah, there's a good example. Uh, China enacted a ban, you know, a handful of years ago on uh, uh, some cryptocurrencies. So that means that there's a huge supply of consumers out there that we can't sell those to. Cryptocurrencies, speculation, yeah, I, I'm okay with that. Minimal correlation, we said that er earlier. Prices may diverge from those in typical investment assets. This is what I was saying with the stock market crash. Do we, do we move those assets into cryptocurrency? All right, here's a good exam question. Valuation and performance. All right, so what are some of these um, factors or characteristics? You know, what kind of a market is out there? What's the network look like, technology? Now, you know, I've explained that in, you know, a probably rudimentary fashion, but technological pro progress, you know, it's who knows what it's going to be like in 10 years. Regulation, speculation, and the market's appetite for risk. And that takes us through these learning outcomes. So what I'm going to repeat this. You know, I think that the, the fourth one is the most important, but the Institute, uh, the Institute doesn't uh, lend too much time in the learning module, but I would still know those exactly how they relate to all of the other um, alternative investments. So I want you to go to the uh, end of the learning module, like I always do. There's some really good questions out there. Probably take you about 20 minutes to get through it, but lots of them are definitions. So I think that'll help prepare you for the exam. So hey, uh, thanks for watching. Uh, have a great day and good luck studying.